Hello everyone, uh, hello Jean. Uh, hello. Today we are recording the fourth video of uh, our six part series of interview uh, with Jean Bricmont. Um, and uh, Jean Bricmont, as I said in the previous uh, videos, uh, Jean is a, a professor emeritus of theoretical physics at Louvain University. And uh, you can find uh, uh, the links in the description. Uh, to Jean, uh, John's books and uh, articles. Uh, today, uh, so uh, last in the previous video, sorry, we talked about uh, non-locality, and um, in the yes, in the last video, we talked about the misunderstandings of uh, Bell theorem, and today we are uh, 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 changing, uh, switching uh, from non-locality to uh, De Broglie-Bohm theory. Uh, uh, th uh, this is an uh, uh, heterodox or unorthodox uh, quantum theory, um, which uh, which is uh, uh, the quantum theory that uh, John is um, uh, championing. And so this is uh, uh, maybe the the most important video of our series. And um, I will I will let uh, Jean speak now. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, um, I don't know if I share the. Do I share? Yes, 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 yes. But it's it's not a uh, uh, you're sharing, but it's not a full screen. Ah, wait, 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 wait. Hmm. Yes. Uh. No. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. But it's not the the first slide. No. Uh, yes, you have to yes the previews. Yes, that's okay. The I want to start by summarizing the previous videos. In the first one, we introduced the central notion of quantum mechanics, the wave function. But we saw that while it success, there is an algorithm which allows it to successfully predict the result observed in the laboratory. There are two problems. One is the evolution of this wave function differs according to whether or not a measurement is made. And more fundamentally, this wave function has no clear meaning outside of the laboratory. In the second video, we saw that the most natural meaning of the wave function outside the laboratory, namely the so-called naive statistical interpretation, which consists in introducing hidden variable for all measurable physical quantities, doesn't work. And we have seen in connection with this impossibility that the reasoning combining the EPR argument of 1935 and Bell's argument of 1964 implies the existence of instantaneous actions at a distance in nature. In the third video, we discuss the misunderstanding of this reasoning. Now, let me start with, since I want to discuss what I call the De Broglie-Bohm theory, some other people call it Bohmian mechanics. I don't really care about the word. I want to, you know, say that there is a way to understand rationally quantum mechanics, quantum phenomena, and the theory uh, the boil bomb can be summed up in one sentence. Contrary to what you have been told, particles do follow trajectories, but those trajectories are very different from those of classical physics. Without going into historical details, the idea of this theory was put forward between 1923 and 1927 by Louis de Broglie, a French physicist and Nobel Prize winner, but then abandoned by him. It was rediscovered and developed by David Bohm in 1952, then also by John Bell, we'll mention that later, and more recently by Dürer, Goldstein and Zangi, and later by several other researchers, in particular uh, students of, of uh, Detlef Dürer. And including you. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I wouldn't call myself. I'm just trying to, you know, explain the theory, but I wouldn't say that I developed yes, it. Yes, yes. But you, yes. So the point is that we are asking in the previous videos whether the description by the wave function is complete or whether you should introduce additional variables that are so-called hidden variables to complete the description of a single particular quantum system. And the completion in the Boyle Bohm theory is simply adding one so only variable you add are the positions of the particle. So let's start the single particle, then the complete state 
is a pair where psi is the usual quantum wave function and x is the particle's position. And, and the, 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 the particles uh, have a position uh, whether or not you're measuring. measuring uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. Just the, 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 yeah. They just have position just the same way that the moon has a position, yes. you, know, you look at it or not. Mm. And they evolve in time. Like most physical quantities, you have to say what are the evolution and the wave function evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. In particular, it doesn't collapse contrary to what happens in ordinary quantum mechanics. And the position evolves according to so-called guiding equation, which means that the velocity at time t is a function of the wave function at the same time t. So it's a function of psi uh, of x of t, t. Now, of course, I did not write the specific formula because I want to limit the number of formula, but conceptually, it's a function of the wave function. Nevertheless, you can write it very easily in the simple case where psi, for example, is a function of one space variable, x is one space variable, you can write psi as the radial part of, it's a complex wave function, so it's a radial part and there is a phase, and the phase is called s, is denoted s of xt, then the guiding equation becomes the velocity is proportional to the, to the derivative of the phase relative to the spatial variable, mm -hmm. evaluated at x of t. The exposition is the hidden variable of this theory, but it's not hidden at all because that's the only thing you detect directly. If I go back to the two slit experiment, then you detect always the particle at one point and these curves, which have a wavy form, represent the statistics of the detection when you send many particles one by one and you detect them according to a second world. But the only thing you ever see, really see in these experiments the, the, the wave function is a theoretical construct, but the only thing you ever see is actually the position. Yeah. Paradoxically, that's the wave function, which is uh, the hidden variable. In the in process. a sense, uh, well, the wave function is the theoretical construct. We would say we wouldn't call it a hidden variable, but it's not. Yes. I mean, the, the word hidden variable is a very, very bad misnomer, but uh, that's the way it is. And then... We've seen theorems against hidden variables, and you can't introduce hidden variables as you might want, but there is no theorem that prohibits the introduction of a position variable. And the position, position are the only hidden variable in this theory. There are no hidden variables associated with other physical quantities, such as the energy, the velocity, the angular momentum, etc. If one did introduce such hidden variable, one might run into conflict with the no hidden variable theorems as I explained before. But here, uh, there is no such uh, prohibition. Instead of describing the guiding equation in detail, I will illustrate them with the two slit experiment. So here, we have a numerical simulation of the solution of the De Bruyne-Born theory. You have the two slits. And then, of course, the electrons are sent by either, they all go through one slit, and they all follow a given trajectory. But you see these trajectories are wavy here, which means that in this region where there is no potential, no force acting, they don't follow the first law of motion of Newton, which says that particles, when there are no force, move in straight lines. They have this wavy form, okay? But you see that what happens is that the wave goes through both slits. If the particles, if one of the slit was closed, the trajectory of the particles would be different because the trajectory of the particle is guided by the wave. And the fact that the wave goes through both slits affect the motion of the particle in such a way that you see an accumulation of particles here and very few particles there and there. And, and that's exactly this interference pattern that we saw before, you see. We have this interference pattern. There are lots of particles someplace and very few particles at other places. And that's exactly what this means. And I just want you to want to mention, because it will be important later, that there is a line in the middle that the particles cannot cross. That's a, just a mathematical property of the guiding equation. So it's not and a it's wave not... or particle, it's wave and particle. And uh... yeah, I will, I, will, I will quote Bell on that just in a minute, yes. If you wish, you can say it's both a wave. I mean, it doesn't have either a wave or a particle depending on whether you look or not. Just it's a 
both a wave and a particle, or precisely a particles guided by a wave. I mean, mm. it's like, a, you know, like you could have a boat which is guided by a mm. wave, or you could have it from a, you, you, I mean, it's something which is very easy to understand intuitively, at least. And, and here you have a, a, And it's not a classical dynamics, as, as you said. I just said, no, it doesn't yeah. follow the, mm. the first law of Newton. No, it was just to emphasize this, okay. There are no force, okay. Mm. So it should go in straight line if it, mm. there was no star of Newton, okay? But there is no reason why, because the, the wave is there. The wave affects the particle. So there is no force, but the wave acts on the particle. Mm. And here there is a suggestive experience where people have, in a very indirect way, measured the trajectory of particles and, and they obtain such a picture, which is somewhat suggestive mm. of what we see here. Here it's a numerical simulation, okay? Okay. Then John Bell has described it by saying, it is, not, is it not clear from the smallness of the scintillation on the screen that we have to do with the particles? Because you always, on the screen, you always detect the particle at one point. And is it not clear from the diffraction interference pattern that the motion of the particle is directed by a wave? De Bruyne showed in detail how the motion of a particle passing through just one of two holes in, I mean, he calls it holes instead of slits, but yeah. in the screen, Influenced by wave propagating through both holes. And so influence that the particle does not go to where the waves cancel out, but is attracted to where they cooperate. This idea seems to be so natural and simple to resolve the wave particle dilemma in such a clear and ordinary way that it's a great mystery to me that it was so generally ignored. Nevertheless, we have two questions that arise. How can the De Bruyne-Bohm theory, which is deterministic, it's an de entirely deterministic theory can be reconciled with the apparent random character of quantum mechanics. And to be more specific, isn't this theory refuted by Heisenberg's inequalities, which state that one cannot measure with infinite precision both the position and the velocity of a particle. Here, particles have at all times a position and a velocity. And then you can ask, how does that reconcile with Heisenberg inequalities, which is which are often misunderstood. And from the point of view of the Bray bohm theory, there is no mystery. Hmm. Moreover, what happens to measurement? I mean, uh, isn't the theory refuted by the theorems on the possibility of introducing hidden variables? I already said no, but I want to explain that in more detail. And of course, I will only sketch the answer to these questions. But these questions are secondary questions. The theory, the basic of the theory has already been explained. Or maybe the, the first thing I have to say is, why are they probabilistic? Well, you have to think of the use of probability in classical physics. For example, you can toss coins or dice, and then of course you have a random result. And of course we have also a whole branch of physics called statistical physics, which applies to gases, liquids, solids, and, 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 and many, many phenomena, phase transition, etc., where one uses statistical uh, notion in a physics which in, in principle deterministic. I mean, all this is classical physics, so there is, no, uh, there is no quantum mechanics there. Now, in principle, it's very simple. If you think of coin tosses, the hand, you get random results, okay? It's head, head tails, head tails, and et cetera. Uh, but they can be explained partly by the laws of physics and partly by assumptions about the system's initial conditions. So if you toss a coin or a dice, the idea is that, of course, the motion will be completely deterministic, but the initial conditions are not controllable. We cannot control the initial conditions. And so the initial conditions vary, and so that because they vary, sometimes the result will be head, sometimes tail, or sometimes you will have a six or a five or a three uh, when you speak of a dice. But the laws are completely deterministic, and if you could control the initial condition, then, of course, you would... Uh, could control the final result. And that's a basic principle. When we have statistical notion in physics or in a game of chance or anything like that, the explanation is a combination between the laws of physics and the randomness, the uncontrollable initial condition. And the De Bruyne-Bohm theory is essentially the same reasoning, but you use a property of the dynamics called equivariance, which is illustrated below you start with a certain density of particle here, which is the same as the psi square 
at time zero, and then you let the system evolve, the wave function evolves and the particles evolve, and then the distribution of particles at time t will be the same as psi of xt square. I mean, it should be absolute value, but never mind. I mean, it's a, it's a square of the, the wave function here will be uh, the distribution, the empirical distribution of particles after time t will be that. So, which is <laughs> means is that you assume that the initial position of the particle are distributed according to psi of x zero square. Then at a later time, they'll be distributed according to psi of x t square. Yeah, and, and there is a, uh, just to emphasize this, there is a mathematical uh, proof of that. It's a, it's a theorem uh, in a Bohmian yeah, It's a theorem of Bohmian mechanics, of the broil bohm theory. It's a simple theorem, but it's a theorem, yes. Mm. It's a property of the equation of motion and of yes. the, the guiding, the, 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 the equation of, um, of uh, the Schrodinger equation. So, and to, to summarize it, if the, the, the probability density of uh, finding the particle somewhere in space is uh, um, following the Born rule at uh, the initial time, uh, it will follow the Born rule at... Uh, yeah, what is called, yeah. yeah, I should maybe, I said that before, but the Born rule simply says that the distribution yes. of position will be given by the square of the wave function, the absolute value of square mm. of the wave function. And so, in that sense, you can say that if, for some reason, your initial distribution is like this, then the later distribution will be like that. And of course, why is the initial distribution like that? Then you have a, a problem of the egg and the end. You have to go back ultimately to the origin of the universe, which is not something I want to go into. And so that's why what I do here is a bit of a sketch, but not a detailed justification. But but it's an, impor an important result because it allow uh... It allows oh, uh, yeah. mechanics to repro reproduce the same predictions as the uh, mechanics. Yes. yes, yes. Of course, that's that's why we get these random results. These mm -hmm. apparently random results. Then, of course, you have the, as I said, the problem of Heisenberg's inequality. But first, I want to discuss measurements in the De Bruyne-Bohm theory. Okay. Mm. So let's start by explaining what a spin measurement means. Here is an idealized spin measurement. You start with a wave function, which is a superposition, a sum of a spatial part and a, a spin part. So it's a, a combination of spin up and spin down in the direction where the spin is being measured. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that the wave function splits into two, pa two parts. One goes in the direction of the field and the other goes in the direction opposite to the field, and the particle goes in that direction. That just describes mathematically what happens in a in an idealized spin measurement. So there, there, is a, there is a splitting of the wave function, but not of the the particle, which no, of course the particle is a yes. particle. It, yes. it cannot split. It wouldn't mm. make sense because it's a point particle. Yes, so yes. It, what? But the wave function, of course, splits into two parts. Mm. Yes, and then of course the real situation is like this. If you do uh, the this is the replaces the magnetic field, this plays the role of this magnetic field and this box, if you wish. And then what you observe, you send these electrons and then all these atoms, I, uh, atoms, it's really uh, atoms here, uh, they will either go up or down. I mean, classically, you would expect them to have a distribution like this, some mm -hmm. continuous distribution, but quantum, the surprise quantum mechanically is that either they go up or they go down. And that's exactly what we have here, okay, in this chemical, in this uh, uh, sketching picture. And now, of course, suppose we see, reverse the orientation of the field. So if you wish, we invert the north-south the north -south here. Um, then what will happen is that the particle, if it starts exactly with the same initial condition, exactly the same uh, wave function, it will go in the direction of uh, it will go in the direction of the field. So it, it will go it will go in the direction opposite to the field. Namely, it will yes. still go. That's yes. just a property of the dynamics. The particle will still go up mm. because it cannot cross the line. There is a line in the middle that it cannot cross. Mm. I remind you of what happened previously in the double seat. There was a line in the middle that it cannot cross, and here the line in the middle it cannot cross either. So if it starts above that line, it will go above, irrespective of the direction of the field. 
So re reversing the field the field direction uh, doesn't change in any way the particle tra trajectory, uh, but it it uh, it does change the result because instead of being uh, up, it will be down. Exactly. What this is what I see here. In the first case, you say that the spin is up. In second case, you say it's down. Okay, mm. because it up by definition means it goes in the direction of the field. And down, it goes in the direction opposite to the field. But since it goes in the up direction on the figure, in both cases, in one case, it's up, and the other case, it's down. So now what it means, what the lesson of that is that the measurement of spin does not, does not measure an intrinsic property of the particle, but results from an interaction between the physical system and the measuring device. I say it's an interaction because it depends on the result depend not only on the property of the particle, it does depend on the property of the particle, but also on the arrangement of the measure, the details of how you measure the spin, mm. not just the, the axis that you choose to measure. No, no, for the same quantity, uh, direction, the spin in some direction, the detail of the orientation of the field matters. And the same thing happens with all other measurements of physical quantities, except for position measurement. When you measure the position, you measure something real. But then, of course, since those measurements do not measure intrinsic properties of the particle, the De Bruyne-Bohm theory is not refuted by the no hidden variable theorem because those theorems say it's impossible to attribute intrinsic property to particles that measuring devices will merely reveal. Okay, mm. and that's of course what they what uh, they don't do. I mean, it's this theory they don't reveal property of particles, so they are not refuted by those theorems. They are very very happy with those theorems. John Bell, again, I won't quote him, he, he was a big defender of the Braille Boom theory, something which people don't understand. He said, the charge against the word measurement is that the word comes loaded with meaning from everyday life, meaning which is entirely inappropriate in the quantum context. Okay, if I have a table in front of me and if I say I measure the length of the table, well, I take a meter and measure the length, I of course ex mean, unless I'm a complete idealist, that the table has a length before I measure it and I reveal, my measurement reveals the property of the table, namely its length, okay? When it is said that something is measured, it is not it is difficult not to think of the result as referring to some pre-existing property of the object in question. This is to disregard Bohr's insistence that in quantum phenomena, the apparatus as, per, as well as the system is essentially involved. That's a bit an irony of the situation is that even though Bohr is usually thought of being very much opposed to Bohm's theory, although it's not mm -hmm. clear what he thought of it. He was also always emphasizing that the in 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 the measurement of quantum theory, you don't measure necessarily a property of the of the system because there is an interaction with the measuring device. Mm -hmm. But 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 in the De Bruyne Bohm theory, the role of the measuring device is a consequence of the theory's equation and not from some more mm -hmm. more or less a priori intuition as in Bohr's case. Okay. So there is in the De Bruyne Bohm's theory, no deus ex machina, no privileged status confer to anthropocentric notions such as the measurement, the observation, the observer, etc., which should have no place in a fundamental physical theory. In the Bruyne theory, there is no measurement problem, nor is there a problem of ontology, given that the world is made of four particles in motion. We are back to a classical ontology, if you wish, but a different equation of motion. I mean, it's like classical mechanics. There are particles in motion everywhere, outside of laboratory or in the laboratory, etc. And the laboratory simply, uh, we understand how there's this interaction between the measuring device and the quantum system. Now, let's, let's briefly discuss the question, of course, that may be more for experts, but the Heisenberg inequalities, because the Heisenberg inequality is something which is constantly referred to as being sort of the big mystery of quantum mechanics. What do they say exactly? They say that the product of the dispersion or the variance of the result of measurement of the position and the measurement of the velocity of a particle, the product of those things, cannot be less than a given number. Cannot be less than a given number. I repeat it twice, but anyway. And this often leads to two different conclusions. People say that position and velocity cannot be measured simultaneously with an infinite precision, or it proves that there is some intrinsic randomness in nature, which I don't think, okay, 
strictly speaking, it's just a statistical constraint uh, on the uh, yes. yes, but uh, it's it's often uh, interpreted as a uh, as a metaphysical uh, exactly you know, uh, uh, truth. Oh. It's supposed to have a metaphysical meaning, but so I mean, strictly speaking, it just means that if you take mm. these measurement of position and velocity, then there pro there is a certain variance because they are all statistical. Okay, we have seen the the results are statistical. So we have a certain, you can define the variance of the distribution and the product of the variance cannot be arbitrarily small. Mm. But then you say, okay, but the theory is deterministic. How do you reconcile that with the deterministic theory? And I will take a very simple example. You have a, a, a particle in a box and in the De Bruyne bohms theory, it can be at rest. In actual fact, it's not always at rest, but let's imagine it is at rest. So it means it's somewhere in the box and it doesn't move. And of course, then you know by the theory, you know the velocity because it's zero. And you can also measure its position as precisely as we like, because that, that's not contradicted by anything. You could measure the position of the particle. And you could say, well, isn't that a contradiction to Heisenberg's inequality? So isn't that refuted by Heisenberg's inequality, which is supposed to be an absolute truth in quantum mechanics? And it, it is a truth in quantum mechanics. The problem is that doing so I mean, it's not what you call measuring the velocity in quantum mechanics. To do what people call a measurement of velocity, you have to open the box. Then the particle will escape. It will start moving, actually, according to the quantum equation. And you measure its position after, uh, after a certain time. And then you deduce its velocity by dividing the distance traveled by the time that has elapsed. And if you do this, you will obtain statistical results that will satisfy Heisenberg's inequality. So you will have a certain uncertainty on the initial position because you don't know where the particle is in the box and you will have a certain distribution of of, of, of velocities if you pro uh, proceed as I just said. And then of course you are going to have, uh, so we'll say the product of these observations will satisfy Heisenberg's inequalities. And so there is no contradiction. There, uh, there is a clear link between uh, this part about the Heisenberg inequality and the, the previous part, uh, the one about uh, contextuality, the one about uh, how the measurement uh, um, uh, affects the, the system, because the speed that we measure is not the same that the speed the, the particle. No, uh, sorry? But, the, but, the, but the, the difference is that here, you there is a velocity, and the measurement of velocity does not reveal the pre existing velocity. Yes. Okay, in yes, the case yes. of the spin, wait, wait. In yes, the yes, there is the no spin. spin. Okay, yes. You don't, there is no value of the spin pre-existing mm. to measure. So the, there you could say the value of the spin is created by the measurement, and here it's sort of... Yes, but do, the, the measure... You obtain a velocity, but it's not the initial velocity of the experiment. Okay, but okay, but it's contextual as well because it depends on the measurement process? Or Yeah, it depends on the... Well... Uh, yes and no. I mean, it depends on the measurement process, if you wish. But I think this um, measurement process will provide, will give you a, a velocity which is, you know, well defined. I mean, uh, uh, I don't think you will get different velocities depending on the the way you measure it. At least I don't know what other ways to measure it there is. Okay. 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 So now, of course, one of the things we said in the video two and three is that the world is not local. So if the world is not local, the Braille Bohm theory must be non-local. That was actually, and it's still used as an argument against it. Ah, but it's non-local. Yeah, but that's a quality yeah. because it has to be. But let me briefly explain why it's non-local. I've not said what the wave function, what the form of the wave function is for n particle, or I said it in the previous talks, but now it's a function of x1, y1, z1, up to xn, y, z, y, and z, and where the xi, y, i, z, i, R coordinates in R3, and each triple is associated with a particle, the one of index i. And then it evolves according to Schrodinger's equation, and the guiding equation is uh, fj, and that should be f mm. and the index j, that's a mistake, mm. but of psi, where x1, y1, z1 are functions of time, and the position at time t, and gj is the velocity of the particle of index j. This should be index j, but anyway. The crucial property of that equation 
is that the velocity of one particle depends on the position of all the other particles in the system, making the theory non-local. To be very concrete, consider two particles. And if you add that time t on particle two, you will change, of course, the values of their position, at least in principle. Therefore, you will change the value of f1, the function f1, because these are the arguments of that function. So if you change the argument in general, you change the value of that function. And of course, that changes the velocity of the first particle because of that. But the first and the second particle can be arbitrarily far apart. So by acting on some place, you change instantaneously the velocity at another place. And historically, I already said that, but it was because Bell was very interested in the Breuil-Bohm theory, the, the, the theory that he arrived at his discovery, discovery of non-locality. He wondered whether we could do better than the Breuil-Bohm, namely uh, have a local theory that would complement quantum mechanics as the de Breuil-Bohm theory does. And he arrived at the conclusion that this is impossible. So it's, it's a virtue of the of de Breuil-Bohm theory to make the non-locality very blatant. Yeah, very explicit, yeah, of course. Yes. Okay, this is, of course, uh, gives a half idea of the theory, but doesn't leave aside many details. You could ask, nevertheless, what's the relationship between the double bohm theory and ordinary quantum mechanics? And in particular, people say, does the theory make any prediction other than ordinary quantum mechanics? And the answer is no. And in fact, given the empirical successes of ordinary quantum mechanics, it's a good thing that it doesn't make, it makes the same prediction. Otherwise, that theory would be experimentally refuted. But then the next objection is, what's the point if they make the same prediction? And the answer is that the, the double bohm theory is a theory about the world, while I've been trying to convince you in the first talk that ordinary quantum mechanics is not. Quantum, ordinary quantum mechanics is a theory about results of measurement in laboratories. And making sense of the wave function outside laboratories is impossible or highly problematic. But since there are so many applications of quantum mechanics, all the modern technology, electronics, etc., all that depends on quantum mechanics. So there must be something, there must be a theory of that makes sense outside the laboratory. And the De Bruyne poem theory is exactly that theory. It gives meaning to this theory outside of laboratories. It's not another theory than quantum mechanics or an interpretation, because there are tons of books about interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's what I call the completion or the rational completion of ordinary quantum mechanics. And ordinary quantum mechanics can be seen as an algorithm which allows predictions to be made about results of laboratory measurement, but which is deduced from the De Bruyne-Bohm theory. And then, of course, it changes your view of the world completely. Now, there are no mystery about quantum mechanics. Of course, non-locality is mysterious, but it's there. And uh, other than that, it's just matter in motion as uh, in classical mechanics, and you can understand what happens in the measurement process. There is no observer, there is no, there is just nothing mystical about it, no consciousness, nothing like that. And as I say, it's just complete, it's just the whole theory is completed. Now, of course, there are many, many objections to that theory, whether it's compatible with relativity, what you do in quantum field theory, etc. And that will be discussed in the next video. So this was the point of this was to give you an overview of what the De Bruyne-Bohm theory does and encouraging, I will put references to books and uh, articles that uh, you know allow you to go further if you want to. But uh, that's basically what I want to say today. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, and uh, see you soon for the next video. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs>